Welcome to Soils Part 2. Today we are going to talk about the soil profile. Um, soils vary in composition, texture, structure, and color at different depths. So whenever we were on our little hike down by the river, that top layer of soil by the river was a lot finer sand than if we dug down. When we dug down, we got a lot of gravel and rocks and things like that. So at different depths, we get different things. Um, our horizons are the variation in soil that divides soil into zones. And we have three main horizons that we're going to talk about today, A, B, and C. And then our soil profile is all of those horizons put together, and it's going to be in a vertical, um, a vertical section. So the reason when we went hiking that we dug down a few inches deep was so that we could get all of these different horizons in our soil samples. Although we probably aren't going to have them all, um, we should at least see one to two distinct soil horizons. So our top soil is the A horizon right over here. And if you look at this, we're gonna have O above that. So that's our organic materials, our grass, things like that, um, our roots. And then after that, we have A, our topsoil. Consists of mainly organic matter, including, including organisms. Um, the lower part of the A horizon is a mixture of mineral matter and organic matter. So up here, we have mostly our organic matters, and then as we fade down, we're losing some of that organic matter and getting more mineral matter. Our next layer we're going to talk about is this B horizon right here. Um, our B horizon is called the subsoil. B horizon, subsoil, contains clay washed out of the A horizon. So as it's raining down here, um, the rain is carrying the particles from this topsoil down, and it's going to take mostly the clay particles down into the subsoil. Um, if the clay hardens, it creates a hard pan or thick clay layer impermeable to plant root. So as we were talking last notes about that triangular um, soil graph, this subsoil, if it contains too much clay, is going to be where our roots can't go down into, and it's going to create poor fertility area for plants to grow. Um, and then we have our sea horizon, and that's going to be between the subsoil right here and our bedrock, or the solid bottom rock part, often called R. Um, our sea horizon is only partially weathered. Some of it still may be bedrock, and it's closely going to resemble the, resemble the parent material or this R layer bedrock. So this sea soil is getting weathered from the solid rock down here. So these two layers are going to be very closely related. Soil types. We have three different types of soil that we're going to talk about um, and the implications for all of those. So um, our three common types are the petal fir, petal cow, and latrolite. And climate is the most important factor on these soil types and how these soils form. Let's go ahead and start with the petal fir. Petal fir usually forms in temperate areas that receive more than 63 uh, centimeters of rain each year. This soil type is present in much of the eastern half of the U.S., most often in forested areas. So if you're ever in a foresty area, we're going to see a lot of this petal fir soil. Um, you can tell it's petal fir soil because it contains large amounts of iron oxide and aluminum rich clays, which will give it this red brown color right here. So if it has iron oxide in it, it's likely to rust. So these are going to look like extremely rusty soils. But they won't be so rusty that they're going to look like this bright red. In fact, this soil right here um, does have some iron oxide and aluminum oxide in it. So <clears throat> these ones, these latrolites are going to be more rusty. These are like a mild rust. Our next type of soil is our pedocal. Um, this is usually found in drier areas. Um, a lot of times in the western U.S. where grass and bush vegetation are common, so kind of a prairie type grass. It contains less clay due to less chemical weathering. In these dry areas, we don't get as much rain, which means we don't get as much acid materials mixing with our soils. Therefore, we're not going to get as much chemical weathering. It's going to be light gray to brown due to high amounts of calcium and um, calcium carbonate and calcite. So if we remember our calcium carbonate is CaCO3 and our calcite is also going to have the Ca in it. Um, 
we talk about our bones being made out of calcium or milk has a lot of calcium in it. So our calcium in the solid form typically has this white color, which, would, which is what causes these to be light gray to brown. And lastly, our latrolites. If you look down here, this is the temple at Angkor, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Um, this temple was constructed out of this type of soil up here between 1113 and 1150. So this latrolite soil, they make bricks out of in these older, older areas and can construct huge temples just like this. So it's in hot, wet, tropical areas, which Cambodia is, and it has intense chemical weathering. So um, all of our, as we discussed earlier, our hot, um, wet climates create more weathering, especially chemical weathering. It speeds up those reactions. We get extreme moisture, which washes away silica and calcite material, leaving this iron oxide and aluminum oxide. The slasherlite ones are going to be are more rusty than the petal furs, um, and they're more typically like this bright reddish orange color. Um, so when it's dried again, it's these nice bricks and they become almost waterproof, which is why we can build these beautiful buildings out of them. They're fairly resistant after they're dried up and in these nice bricks to any type of chemical weather. Um, contains almost no or organic matter in the latrolite areas, which is opposite of what you would think, right? Because you're thinking, oh, warm, hot, tropical areas, lots of plants growing, but as our plants are growing, they're taking the nutrients out of those dead plants almost exactly as they die. So our plants die and their nutrients are absorbed by living plants rapidly. In a lot of these areas, they're clearing all of the forests. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about some of the deforestation, deforestation issues that we're having, but in areas, um, this is all lateralite soil down here and over here and they're clearing out all of these tropical forests. Um, and these are the poorest soils for agriculture because the plants are sucking up the nutrients so quickly that they have nothing left. So after we've cleared everything out of here, this soil is basically useless for us. We, have, we can't use it for agriculture anymore. We're just destroying part of our world and we're getting one of, rid of or heavily cutting down on one of our best natural resources. Also, in these areas, as it rains a lot, um, our soils are going to get washed away more easily because they're not now cemented to the ground by these lovely trees and vegetation. So not only is it creating a problem for us in the future, but um, we're getting a lot of erosion. Speaking of erosion, that's where we're going, soil erosion. So how water erodes, erodes soil. Um, water acts like a tiny bomb on the soil. So as it hits the soil, it's like bombing it out and little grains are flying up with it. Um, sheet erosion is when sheets of water wash away weathered soil. So we have our soil sediments and then water will come over like a river and take some of those sediments with it. Um, like on this hill, the water might have washed down in the sheet and then it creates these tiny cracks right here, which are called rills. And they're basically tiny streams that erode um, and will further erode into trenches and gullies. Water is not our only thing that erodes soil. We also get a lot of soil erosion from human activities like removing natural vegetation, um, farming, lodging, construction. Um, those things are going to heavily erode our soil because we're moving trees, we're getting rid of the natural state of earth and then we're left with weathered and torn up ground that can be easily eroded away. Ah, here we go with that. Human activity removes natural vegetation and accelerates erosion. The plants hold soil together so when we're removing those plants we're getting rid of all of our, our solidifiers and then our soil can erode away easily. Um, we can measure soil erosion by me measuring the soil in the streams so we can measure how much sediment is being taken down in a stream to determine how much overall is getting eroded. And the wind erodes soil at a slower rate than water usually. 
um, the time that that would be opposite of what you think is during things like prolonged drought, strong winds can remove large quantities of soil from areas that are unprotected. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the, the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, which plagued the like southwestern United States down there, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, um, all of that. They were in a severe drought, and then there was huge winds, and it ended up just tearing a whole bunch of their land up. To combat that now, we plant trees to pr provide a wind barrier. Um, all right, here's our main objectives for you today. There was three. So can you describe three soil horizons found in most mature soils? Can you tell what climates are usually associated with petal fir, petal cow, and latrolite? And can you explain how activity such as road construction affects the rate of soil erosion? Please answer these questions at the bottom of your notes. Have a great weekend.